Okay, so good morning and uh, welcome to our 13th meeting of uh, Classical Mechanics 1 at CMI. Uh, today is the 13th of September, it turns out, uh, 2022. Um, so last time we were talking about uh, Newton's second law and uh, Galileo's relativity principle, which we will continue now. <clears throat> um, on Con had a question about uh, problem five, oh, sorry, the, the fifth uh, problem set, the last question for the significance of the matrix A. So that is something we will talk about uh, in the coming days. <clears throat> so it definitely has some meaning, the powers of A and so on. <clears throat> and any questions you have about um, the, the latest problem set that you submitted <clears throat> yesterday? Uh, I, I had only this question. Okay, fine. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. Um, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, uh, how are things uh, with your courses? Uh, any any um, general comments you have? Are you busy, not busy? What is the situation? Busy. <laughs> very, very busy. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Okay, fine. <clears throat> um, do, you, do you have uh, uh, assignments in other courses at this uh, stage? <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay, fine. All right. Um, so feel free to give me any feedback, not necessarily uh, during the class, but even at other times. Um, okay, so let us uh, go back to where we were. <clears throat> um, so last time we introduced uh, this uh, uh, Galileo's uh, principle of relativity, which basically said, um, uh, I mean, the way he discovered it was to compare the motion, um, uh, uh, compare uh, uh, the motion of physical bodies in a, in a ship that's docked at the shore and one that is moving uniformly in the sea. And he found that there is no way to tell without looking out of the ship um, that it is actually moving uniformly. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the, in other words, uh, and, and in order to encode this observation, um, we uh, postulate this uh, principle of Galilean relativity, which states that the laws of mechanics must be such that they take the same form in two inertial frames that are in uniform motion relative to each other. Okay, So I should probably have said that slightly differently. Suppose you have one inertial frame and the laws of physics are written in a certain manner over there. <clears throat> yeah, maybe F equal to MA or other statements of that sort. And then you have another frame that is moving uniformly relative to it <clears throat> in any direction at whatever speed you wish then the laws of mechanics in that frame must look the same. In other words, they must not involve the relative velocity between the two frames. That's what we mean. Um, if they involve the relative velocity between the frames, then you could tell the frames apart. Okay, so that is the idea. So the laws of physics must take the same form in both the frames so that you cannot tell which one you are in. <clears throat> okay, so this is the idea of, um, Galileo's principle of relativity. Um, we are going to see it uh, more concretely in a moment now. Uh, okay, so any question about that statement? All right, uh, if not, let me now connect uh, Galilean principle of relativity to Newton's second law. <clears throat> so, that is our next business. Um, one second. Yeah. So with these assumptions, and the assumptions are the things I mentioned last time about um, uh, the length scales being uh, the same for both observers and uh, intervals between two events being the same. Yeah. Masses being the same of particles. So with these assumptions, um, 
the appearance of the acceleration or double dot rather than velocity in Newton's second law can be motivated. So you might ask, where did Newton get his second law from? And the answer is using Galileo's relativity principle. <clears throat> so you may ask, why is it MR double dot and not MR dot? Yeah, on the left-hand side of Newton's second law. Uh, now we can answer that question. Uh, the appearance of R double dot rather than R dot ensures that when referred to a frame S prime, moving at constant velocity u relative to an inertial frame s. So you have two frames. You have frame s and another frame s prime, which is moving at velocity u. Okay, So it's moving at velocity u. I mean, not necessarily in the x direction, could be moving in some direction, but a fixed direction with a constant velocity u relative to the original frame s. Uh, Newton's second law, we're going to observe now that Newton's second law takes the same form for a system of interacting particles. Of course, Newton's second law says that mass times acceleration is equal to the force. Yeah. Uh, now we must say what kind of forces we are studying. And here we are studying a system of particles. So there would be the accelerations of each of the particles present equal to the force felt by the particle. And this force is due to the other particles present. Okay, So that is the setup. <clears throat> so let us uh, just uh, look at it quickly. Mm, for example, suppose the frames coincide at t equal to 0. So at t equal to 0, both frames coincide, x and s prime are at the same place. Uh, then we can write a formula for the position vector of a particle relative to s prime in terms of that in s. Okay, so I look at this little triangle. Um, this is r prime, this is r, and this vector, uh, which is the difference between the origins of the two coordinate systems, is simply u times t. Hmm? They coincided at t equal to 0. So at time t, the origin of s prime is at the position u t. Uh, so the origin of s prime is at u t at time t relative to origin of s. Okay. As a consequence, looking at that little triangle, we can say that r is equal to u t plus r prime. Okay, so I'm looking at this triangle. I'm just enlarging it over here. This was r, this is u t, and this is r prime. Okay, this is origin of the old system of s, and this is the origin of the prime system s prime. Okay, so looking at this triangle and using our parallelogram law of addition of vectors, we get this formula. Or in other words, r prime is equal to r minus ut. Okay, so now we can make use of that. I need to write Newton's equation starting from the original one, which was mr double dot is equal to some force. Okay, but let us first work with mr double dot. What does that become? It becomes for r a substitute r prime plus ut and then must take the second derivative of that. Yeah, You will notice that the second derivative when it hits the term ut will give you zero okay? because it's a linear function of time and you have to present it in twice and therefore mr double dot is the same as mr prime double dot. Okay? So this is the essential conclusion um, that the acceleration term looks the same in both frames. Okay, is it clear what we did? <clears throat> Any question about this little observation? So the immediate consequence then is that the equation for a free particle is the same in both frames because the equation was originally mr double dot equal to zero, but mr double dot is the same as mr prime double dot. So the equation for a free particle is the same in both frames. Hmm. So we have already now checked 
that if a particle is free in the first frame, yes, it will be free as observed by an observer in the new frame. So they will agree on this basic fact. So a particle is free in one frame, if and only if it is free in the other, moving at constant velocity. So we have made progress. <clears throat> we have seen that the concept of a free particle is a robust concept. It is not dependent on which frame you are in, as long as they are moving uniformly relative to each other. Okay. Now we can progress from free particles to particles moving, sorry, particles subject to forces. So let us similarly consider Newton's second law for a pair of particles subject to an interparticle force. Okay. So I have a lab inside which I have two particles and they may be maybe two masses and they have some gravitational force between each other. That is one possibility. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and that gravitational force or whatever force that depends on the relative distance between the two particles. Okay. So that is what we are considering. <clears throat> so what are the equations of motion? Let us write them down. The equations of motion are Newton's second law for these two particles. So we have two equations. First gives you the mass times acceleration of the first particle is the force on the first particle due to the second particle. Okay. F2 on one. Now that force depends on the distance between the two particles. So I have written it in this manner. <clears throat> We are considering such a situation. And similarly, mass times acceleration of the second particle is the force of the first particle on the second, F1 on two, again, depending on the distance between the two particles. Okay, so we are considering such a situation. Now, we just have to transform this equation into the new frame <clears throat> change. Yeah, if I go to the primed frame, m r one double dot will be equal to m r one prime double dot. Okay, I'm omitting that vector symbol. Uh, by the way, I hope you can, yeah, maybe there's some lag in my internet connection. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so the left-hand sides don't change. Now, what about the right-hand sides? Since the force dependent on the relative location of the two particles, I must consider R1 minus R2. <clears throat> okay. And for that, I substitute R1 is equal to R1 prime plus UT and R2 is equal to R2 prime plus UT. Okay, that was the transformation that we just worked out a moment ago. Yeah. Um, and the key thing is that when I take the difference between these two, You will notice that the UT terms simply cancel out in the difference, and R2 is the one prime minus R prime. The relative vector between two particles' locations are the same whether they are referred to a frame that is sitting in the ship, which is sitting at the shore, or if the frame itself is moving at constant velocity. So we observe that the velocity u cancels out from the difference in position vectors um, and the relative velocity between the frames, namely u makes no appearance. So the equations take the same form in both the frames. From the equations, there is no way to tell that one frame was moving relative to the other. <clears throat> yeah. This kind of argument will be used again and again in more and more sophisticated ways elsewhere. Uh, but this, this is goes back to this argument goes back to <clears throat> um, Newton and Galileo. Uh, of course, the notation was not available at that time. So the ideas were available. <clears throat> um, okay. Um, so you can also cancels out from the difference in velocity vectors. So notice that. If I consider R dots rather than Rs, um, and then again, take the difference. Uh, again, this uh, extra term, U minus U will go away. 
So the same conclusion applies to interparticle forces that depend on velocities. Why do I say this? Because friction is an example of a force that depends on velocities. The faster you move, the greater the friction. This is the idea. Um, yeah, so if there is a force that depended on R1 dot minus R2 dot, okay, that is the relative motion, relative velocity between the two particles. Suppose there are two objects that are sliding one on top of the other with locations R1 and R2. Again, this will be the same as that force evaluated at R1 prime dot minus R2 prime dot because U cancels out from the difference. So what is the practical consequence of these observations? <clears throat> so practically speaking, projectiles move in exactly the same way when observed in two frames in uniform relative motion. Ignoring a possible variation of the external gravitational acceleration. Okay, we are not concerned with external forces, external to our lab. So we are not concerned with those. We have to ignore those things. <clears throat> and similarly, a brick sliding on a plank subject to friction displays the same dynamics. Yeah, it will take the same time to come down. It will accelerate in the same manner, irrespective of whether the experiment is performed below the deck of a docked ship or of a uniformly moving ship. Okay. So, and this is what Galileo noticed. And so his idea has now been encoded in Newton's second law. <clears throat> Any question about this? Yes, uh, the project is moving exactly the same way, uh, you mean the trajectory. Yeah, the trajectory, the shape of the trajectory, how long it takes to fall. Yeah. Um, okay. If you, yeah, those are any any aspect of the projectile's motion. Yeah, how how far up it goes. Yeah, all these things. Suppose you do one experiment inside a lab on a, a ship that is uh, anchored, and then on a ship that is moving uniformly, you will get the same shape relative to the walls of your lab. Okay, not relative to trees outside. <clears throat> okay, um, and, and to emphasize that Newton's second law for a particle subject to an external force. Okay, suppose there's not interparticle forces, but external forces, external to the lab. Newton's equation is not the same in the two frames. Okay, in fact, suppose you start with Newton's equation mr double dot equal to f of r and replace r by r prime plus ut, then the resulting equation of motion left hand side doesn't change. We already argued that. MR double dot is same as MR prime double dot. But in the argument of the force, we are going to get not R prime, but R prime plus UT. <laughs> so this is the equation of motion in S. This is the equation of motion in S prime. And F is an external force that depends on location. It depends on the absolute location, not on relative locations of two particles. And that is the problem. The appearance of U in the S prime frame equation of motion would mean that one could find out which frame corresponds to the moving ship and which to the docked ship. Okay, so I am again emphasizing that Galileo's principle does not apply to external forces. <clears throat> so an example of an external force uh, that is would be significant here is the variation in the acceleration due to gravity at different locations. You know, external forces that change with location can be detected. They can be used to determine that the experiment was performed on a moving ship rather than at a fixed location on the shore because the ship would go to a new place. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and there the acceleration due to gravity may be different. And then the projectile would take a different length of time to fall down. <clears throat> so this does not violate Galileo's principle since Galileo's principle of relativity is not concerned with external forces, but with interparticle forces. Yeah. Uh, so this is our uh, careful statement of um, Galileo's relativity principle <clears throat> and its consequence for Newton's second law. Mm. Okay. 
there are other aspects of Newton's second law, one or two, which I would like to emphasize here. <clears throat> yeah, you might ask, what if Newton's second law for a particle involved velocity instead of acceleration? Okay, suppose the equation said, instead of mass times acceleration, you said mass times velocity or some number, new times velocity is equal to some right hand side, yeah, which is some analog of force, I will call it G here. Hmm. Then suppose this is the equation of motion in frame S, then in a frame moving at velocity, constant velocity U, the equation for a free particle, yeah, free means G is zero. So G is zero, yeah, would take the form new times R prime dot plus U. Okay, because R was R prime plus QT. If you differentiate in time, you will get R dot is equal to R particle. Whereas in the original frame, the equation was new R dot, sorry, R dot equal to zero. So you see that the appearance of U on the left of this equation implies that it does not have the same form as the equation new R dot equal to zero in S. Okay, and therefore this would allow us to determine the velocity U of the frame S prime relative to S and their Leo's principle. Okay, so this is why Newton's second law cannot have a velocity dependent term in the left-hand side. <clears throat> Three particles will obey different equations in the two frames. So let us summarize our discussion. Our conclusion is that relating the force to the second derivative of position as opposed to say, the first derivative is ruled out, we just discussed it's ruled out, but also third derivative or fourth derivative, these are all additional possibilities. But the second derivative is the simplest way of incorporating Galileo's principle. Yeah. You could have a third derivative term that will also obey Galileo's principle. Yeah. But the second derivative is the simplest way of incorporating Galileo's principle. <clears throat> Let me clarify this. Fortunately, experiments and observations confirm that Newton's second law accurately describes both terrestrial and celestial mechanical phenomena, hmm? motion of tennis balls, planets, etc. That is when I say Newton's second law, I mean the one with the second derivative term. So there is no need to include higher derivative terms in Newton's second law, although they would not violate Galileo's principle. If you differentiate R prime is equal to R minus UT three times, the U term will go away. Hmm? So it doesn't violate Galileo's principle, but the current Newton second law already does the proper job, does a proper job. So there is no need to include third derivative or other such terms. So this idea of using the simplest possibility is often appealed to in physics. Yeah, it's called the principle of Occam's razor. <clears throat> yeah. However, there are other reasons also. There are other reasons to avoid higher time derivatives on the left-hand side of Newton's equation. Yeah, suppose, suppose Newton's second law for the position of a particle x of t moving along a line had a third derivative term. Okay, suppose we had the equation of motion mx double dot plus nu times x triple dot is equal to some force f yeah, for some constant nu not equal to zero and f the force. Yeah, now let us see what happens. Consider a free particle that is no external force, F is zero. Then the equation of motion for a free particle as according to this new Newton law would be the following, mx double dot plus new x triple dot equal to zero. Yeah, so let us see what it says. Yeah, let us integrate, it is a differential equation, we can integrate it. Integrate it once, we will get mx dot plus new x double dot equal to a constant. Yeah, I'm just integrating it once. So I will have a constant of integration, which I call alpha. Can integrate it once more, second time to get mx plus new x dot 
is equal to alpha t plus beta. Okay, so one more constant of integration, and then alpha becomes alpha t. I'm integrating with respect to time from t equal to zero to t. Okay. So we got two constants of integration. Now you can integrate a third time. That I'm not going to do here. It takes a little bit more effort. But suppose you do that. I claim that the solution of this equation, if you integrate once more, is the following. It will say that x of t is given by this formula, gamma times, there's a third constant of integration, gamma times e to the power of minus mt by nu plus one by m squared times m times beta plus alpha t minus alpha nu. Okay. So, so these details don't matter too, too much, but I'm going to just emphasize what the contradiction is. What we have discovered is the trajectory x of t of a particle subject to this modified Newton equation, where there's a third derivative term in addition to acceleration. Okay. Now, what is the problem? We notice that if nu is not zero, and this constant of integration gamma is not zero, generally it will not be zero. Um, this trajectory is not a constant speed straight line motion because constant speed would mean x of t must be x zero plus v zero t. Yeah, that is the equation for a straight. Whereas we are getting some variable speed answer here, it depends exponentially on the time. Yeah, it is certainly not of this form. <clears throat> okay, so in other words, free particles according to this Newton modified Newton second law would violate Newton's first law. That is, this free particle trajectory does not have constant speed. For this reason, we conclude that a third derivative term on the left of Newton's second law would not be consistent with Newton's first law. Okay, so, so Newton's first law puts strong constraints on what Newton's second law can be. <clears throat> In particular, third derivative, fourth derivative terms are not allowed. <clears throat> Um, any, any question about this? Okay. You may ask a further question. We are talking about first derivative, third derivative, and so on. What about a term without any derivative? Yeah. We have got our equation of motion, mr double dot is equal to force. But can I add one more term here? Like that doesn't even depend on derivatives. Lambda times r. Yeah, for some constant lambda. Am I allowed to do that? Yeah, turns out even that is not allowed. <clears throat> and for more than one reason. Okay, let me clarify why. First reason is that this would violate Newton's first law because again, if I consider free particle that is the absence of any force, F is zero, again, the solution of this equation is not a straight line. Hmm. MR double dot plus lambda R equal to zero. Yes, you have a question? So could you, can you prove that this is the only differential equation in terms of say F, M and derivatives of R, uh, where F and M are, uh, are given. So like, is this the only differential equation which satisfies Newton's first? Yeah, I mean, that is what we are trying to do. We are trying to argue that this is essentially the only possibility. And so, but you need a couple of ingredients for that. One is Newton's first law, that is, it must uh, predict the right behavior of free particles. But you need one more ingredient, which is Galileo's principle of relativity. That is, it must, uh, the motion it predicts should be the same in two frames that are in uniform relative motion. If you have these two ingredients, uh, then, Essentially, we eliminate other first. possibilities. Isn't that Newton's first law? Uh, I didn't get why it uh, um, get reduced to the relativity in Newton's Newton's first law states that uh, uh, bodies moving uh, like in deep space, they uh, if it's an inertial frame, then they will be moving in uniform speed, right? With uniform. Exactly, velocity. yeah. Yeah. And so, yes. so by definition, 
you take two such so frames. So if you propose some Newton that, second law equation, like the one. I, yeah. So I would. I didn't get why the Liouville's principle of relativity was different from Newton's first law. Uh, sorry, Anhad, I didn't hear you. Could I, I didn't get why Galileo's uh, principle of relativity was different from Newton's first law. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, you didn't. Uh, yeah, I'm hearing only parts of what you said. You, you said that you didn't understand why Galileo's principle of relativity, and then I lost you. Um, see, oh, yeah, I there think seems he's asking different from Newton's first law. I think he's asking different, um, not the same. No, no, see, uh, uh, Galileo's. Uh oh, um, okay, I. Uh, well. Yeah. Uh, one second. So, uh, so spin share is uh, has uh, stopped all of a sudden. I wonder why. Anyway, let us. Yeah. Um, let me share my screen once again. Um, yeah. So. So Anhar asks, uh, I'm saying, why doesn't it follow from Newton's first law? Mm. No, see, Newton's first law only, and that they must move in straight lines at constant velocity. Um, so um, it doesn't tell you about this issue about going to another frame that moves at a um, constant velocity with respect to the original frame. Hmm. And that is something coming from uh, Galileo's principle. Um, okay, let me see what... Um, yeah, okay, I, I need to look into what you are asking a little carefully. Perhaps I will do that and then uh, um, get back to you. Uh, some of what I am discussing is is giving uh, the the historical physical motivation for Newton's second law. Yeah, so Newton's second law came much later. Galileo's principle was present already before that. Uh, in fact, Galileo's principle predates even Newton's first law. Uh, <clears throat> So, um, yeah, uh, uh, okay, so I will, I will go through what you are asking or maybe you can ask it again and uh, I will try to address your questions. <clears throat> um, so what I have tried to convey to you earlier in the last 10 minutes is the observation that Newton's second law incorporates Galileo's relativity principle. That was the aim. Um, because Galileo's relativity principle is something coming directly from experimental observation. So whatever theory we cook up, whatever model we make, needs to respect that. And we need to establish that. Okay, So that is the logical argument. <clears throat> mm. uh, you may be asking a different question about whether uh, Newton's second law follows from the first law or something to that effect. Mm, um, I will need to look into that more carefully. Certainly Newton's second law has additional information because it tells you what happens when forces are present. Uh, yeah, so we do need additional information. Uh, I mean, you need additional postulates there, um, but I will, I will uh, look at it. <clears throat> um, so, so please uh, hold on, Anhad. I will look at your question more carefully, or please ask it subsequently. Um, yeah. Um, so, so okay. W w right now, what we are arguing is that certain terms in the equation of motion are simply not allowed.
a lot of them can be eliminated using Newton's first law. I think that is what you are saying. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so let me just uh, continue with what I was discussing. Mm, suppose we were to include a term that depends explicitly on position in the left hand side of the equation of motion, mm, then Again, you will have a problem. If lambda were not zero, then the equation of motion mx double dot plus lambda x equal to zero does not admit the constant speed solution x of t equal to vt plus x naught. Okay, so this is not a solution. If you put it in, it doesn't solve the equation. Okay, so it would violate Newton's first law. It would also violate another important principle of physics that again predates Newton's first law, um, namely the homogeneity of space. Yeah, the homogeneity of space uh, requires that the laws of mechanics be the same at all locations. <clears throat> how I don't uh, understand how this homogeneity is violated. Violated, in, indeed. Look, so what have we added? We have added the term lambda r. Okay, so so r is of course the position relative to some origin. So if the equation of motion involves r explicitly then the location of the particle relative to that origin becomes important. So you have picked some arbitrary origin and I'm saying the equation of motion of the particle depends crucially let I am from my chosen origin becomes important. Whereas the observation is that that is not important at all. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, oh, who asked that? I think it was on con. Um, uh, no, I mean, uh, how is the homogeneity of space violated? I mean, yeah. this equation mr double dot plus lambda r equal to f. Yes. Uh, I, I Let me show it to you in more explicit terms. One moment. Suppose you make a change to a new frame that is translated. That is, you say r prime is equal to r plus a. Okay. Suppose we do that find out the equation of motion in terms of r prime. Hmm. We will work that out in a moment. What is homogeneity saying? The homogeneity says that the equation of motion does not, cannot involve A. If it involves A, it means that two frames that are a distance A apart will have equations that don't take the same form. Hmm. That will be the problem. Uh, I hope I am conveying this to you. The <clears throat> oh yeah, so, if we if, if we put this in the original equation, then the the form will not remain the same. Exactly, the first term mr double dot term will remain the same. Yes, but the next term will get some, so it will become r prime double dot plus lambda for r. I will get r prime minus a. Yeah. Equal to whatever force this, even if the force is zero, doesn't matter. The problem that the equation of motion, the new equation of motion in the R prime variable, it does not take the same form as the original equation, mr double dot plus lambda r equal to the force. Okay. So for this reason, we say that the explicit appearance of R in this equation is a violation of the homogeneity of space. Hmm. Uh, I must hasten to add, so I've already now explained what I had written here. Newton's equation would not take the same form in a frame that is shifted by a distance A relative to the original frame. Yeah, This does not prevent interparticle forces that depend on distance, Okay, because then you will have R1 minus R2 and you shift both R1 and R2 by A, the A will cancel out. So note that interparticle forces are translation invariant since they depend only on the relative locations of particles. Yeah, the problem lies in the appearance of A on the LHS of the equation of motion in the shifted frame. So that is disallowed. So you cannot tell absolute locations. This is the main message of homogeneity. Absolute locations don't matter. <clears throat> Let me say it in a different way. Uh, yeah. So uh, let me say it this way. If you do an experiment in this room and you do uh, the same experiment in a neighboring room, 
<clears throat> with same external conditions, the result should be the same. This is the requirement. I mean, this is the experimental observation and has now been encoded in Newton's second law. <clears throat> uh, okay, uh, but uh, I will address Anhat's question, uh, but uh, uh, Newton's first law is extremely powerful. It eliminates a lot of things. Yeah, but we have to also recognize that historically, many principles came from natural observations like homogeneity and question was, do your laws satisfy those principles or not? And this is what we are checking. <clears throat> Newton's first law came a little bit later. <clears throat> uh, okay, there is another law uh, or observation, experimental observation that I want to emphasize now. We also postulate that the laws of mechanics must not pick out any particular direction at any given location. So wherever you are, irrespective of which way you look, the space must be the same. We say that space is isotropic. That is the orientation of a frame has no dynamical significance. Operationally, what does it mean? Holding external conditions the same, rotating the experimental apparatus does not change the results of experiments. They are local experiments. <clears throat> so our laws must respect this. Yeah, um, I have uh, done it explicitly for translations, but the same also holds for rotations. Uh, no matter which way you look, uh, the results of experiments must be the same. <clears throat> so along with homogeneity and isotropy of space, so this direction independence is called isotropy. We also postulate the homogeneity of time. What does that mean? Given identical external conditions, the results of mechanical experiments must not depend on when they are done. In other words, the equations of mechanics must be invariant under translations of time, namely t goes to t plus t naught. Under such a translation, the equation of motion must be invariant. <clears throat> uh, I mean, a, a, a certain first uh, requirement for this is that, for instance, the masses of particles that interact cannot change with time. Okay, so we already postulated the mass of a particle is independent of time. Mm. And similarly, if you have an equation mr double dot equal to zero, let's look at free particle. If you take t to t plus t naught, then the derivative with respect to t is the same as the derivative with respect to t prime. So if I call this t prime, d by dt is equal to d by dt prime. You will check because uh, what do we know for sure? d by dt is uh, dt prime by dt times d by dt prime. Okay, so this is how you um, transform derivatives, but dt prime dt is equal to one. So because you just shifted t by constant and therefore the derivatives with respect to time are the same mm. and the equation will not differ. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so just now, uh, uh, so this is, is also called the reproducibility of uh, experiments, uh, results of experiments. If you do the experiment today and then repeat the experiment tomorrow or day after, or your friend repeats them, the results should be the same. Okay, so this, is, uh, this has to do with the homogeneity in time <clears throat> or time translation invariance. So if we combine all these uh, concepts, we say that space rotation invariance, space and time translation invariance, along with the invariance under a change from an inertial frame to one moving at a constant velocity. Yeah. So we have discussed several transformations now, translations in time, translations in space, rotations of space, and moving to a boosted frame of reference. Yeah. Together, these transformations and the invariance of the laws of mechanics under them are called the Galilean invariances of the laws of mechanics. Okay, um, okay. so so that is uh, the name given for all of these uh, transformations and the invariances uh, they they come with. They are all called Galilean invariances. Though Galileo was specifically focused with uh, passage to a frame moving at constant velocity, but nowadays we have sort of combined all of them into one. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, any any question about this <clears throat> Yeah, so, so uh, uh, Anhad, you are quite right that uh, um, uh, the, the appearance of MR double dot on the left hand side of Newton's equation is uh, largely forced upon us by, <clears throat> by Newton's first law, namely the statement that uh, free particles must move in a straight line in an inertial frame. Um, so to that extent, you are correct. <clears throat> uh, uh, but uh, the question is also whether this uh, law also respects some other experimental observations. Um, and that is what we are trying to uh, establish over here. Uh, okay, so uh, now I come to another important uh, uh, feature, which is called the linear superposition of forces. Um, so suppose a particle is acted upon by two forces F1 and F2, <clears throat> yeah. Um, then, so you have a particle that is acted upon by two forces F1 maybe this way and F2 that way. And then according to the principle of superposition, the total force on F, uh, sorry, the total force F on the particle is called the resultant of the two forces and it is the vector sum F equal to F1 plus F2, okay. So, now, uh, I have stated this principle. It is a very useful principle, so I have stated it. However, it is already kind of a consequence of Newton's second law. It is a consistency condition, you might say. It is expected from Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration, um, simply because the acceleration is a vector. And so the right-hand side, the force must also be a vector. And, uh, and of course, vectors can be added using the parallelogram law to obtain the total force. Yeah. So it is in that sense that it is to be expected. <clears throat> um, but uh, it, it's a very useful uh, uh, thing. So uh, I want to emphasize it, I want to highlight it. Uh, Newton himself does not mention uh, the superposition principle for forces as a separate law, but instead he states it as a corollary uh, to his other uh, laws. Um, <clears throat> uh, Okay, but it is very useful and we will uh, exploit it and it goes, I think uh, already some questions about it were raised. Um, um, I think um, uh, <clears throat> Ryan had asked about um, uh, different forces, uh, different causes, you can, you can combine them. Um, now it is also noteworthy that Newton had more than three laws. He had about five or six laws, in fact, in his earlier manuscript, uh, which goes by the name uh, uh, De Motu Corporum in Medis Regulatia Sedentibus, okay, <laughs> Latin name, um, that he wrote a couple of years before the uh, Principia Mathematica. Uh, uh, some postulates and laws, such as a version of the principle of Galilean relativity, were later demoted to corollaries of what we now call his three laws of motion. Okay, so um, the way in which these axioms or uh, postulates were put together itself uh, changed in Newton's own mind and in his time. Um, this was a slightly more economical presentation. Um, so uh, uh, the Galilean relativity principle is now encoded already in Newton's second law. Uh, we don't need a sec an, an additional postulate of that sort. <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, the superposition principle is very useful. It allows us to separately determine individual forces on a body, yeah, which may have distinct origins. Yeah, there may be a gravitational force, a frictional force, an electric force, etc. Um, you may be able to isolate each of them, find out their magnitudes and directions, and so on, and then you add them up to find the total force. Okay, so this is how we work in practice. <clears throat> um, but I want to make a couple of uh, little uh, um, warnings. Um, the equation of motion, which is mr double dot is equal to the force. Uh, it is true that you can combine several forces, F1 plus F2 and get the total force on the body. That is allowed. <clears throat> in fact, you have to do it. Uh, if you want to find the motion in, in 
in the, in the presence of all the forces. However, we don't have a superposition principle for solutions of Newton's equation in general. Okay? It is not as though we can <clears throat> take a solution <clears throat> R1 of t and another solution R2 of t, add them up with perhaps some coefficients <clears throat> and the sum is not necessarily a trajectory. Okay? That is a crucial point. So suppose MR1 double dot is F1 of R1 and MR2 double dot is F2 of R2 are the trajectories in the presence of individual forces. Suppose you know the trajectories in the presence of individual forces like the frictional force and the gravitational force, then putting R equal to R1 plus R2, that is you sort of add the two trajectories, what will you get? You will get MR double dot is equal to F1 of R1 plus F2 of R2. However, the latter, that is the right hand side, is generally not equal to the vector field F1 plus F2, evaluated at R1 plus R2. Okay. Um, so, in general, we cannot add trajectories in the presence of separate forces to get a trajectory when both forces are present. Okay. This does not work. <clears throat> the trajectory in the presence of um, <clears throat> gravity and separately in the presence of friction may be determinable, but you cannot sort of add those two curves and get the true trajectory that does not work. <clears throat> and there are simple examples that will show you this. Um, I hesitate to spend time doing that here. I, I think I will let you uh, uh, take a look at the example that I've given here um, or, or make up examples of your own. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, but I, I want to say one thing, uh, 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 a main point is that Newton's equation of motion, he say, what kind of equation? So could you please uh, suggest to me what kind of equation is it? I've written the equation here, MR double dot equal to F of R. So please describe the equation to me. <clears throat> Mathematically speaking, what kind of equation is it? Second order differential. Correct. So second order differential equation. Mm, indeed. So now let us look at whether it's a linear equation or not. So left hand side, would you say, okay, first of all, what is the unknown quantity? Uh, indeed, R of t is the unknown quantity. So R of t is the unknown. Uh, that's what you want to find. So my question is, is this a linear equation for R of t? Could you address that? Uh, hello, Ankit. Yeah, I'm just uh, in a class. So let's speak later in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So please tell me, would you describe this as a linear equation or not? <clears throat> okay, let's start with the left hand side. Is the left hand side linear? Uh, yes, uh, I, I don't know if I heard you clearly. Um, left hand side is linear because it involves only the first power of R. So the left hand side is linear, but the right hand side is some function of the position, yeah, function of the location. Of course, it may depend on velocities as well. Forces can depend on velocities. That generally is not some linear function of the position. Okay, it can be some very nonlinear function of, of R. Mm, it may be depending on one upon R, it may depend on various things, R squared and so on. Okay, so generally, Newton's second law uh, is a nonlinear second order ordinary differential equation. Okay. And generally, nonlinear equations do not have the property that you can take one solution, another solution, add them, and get a third solution. So that doesn't work for nonlinear equations. For linear equations, that does work. Yeah. Um, and any question about this? <clears throat> okay. Um, if not, let me proceed. So, so there are other aspects of this uh, superposition or what superposition does not mean. Mm. 
So for instance, the superposition principle does not say that we can superpose solutions of Newton's equation for a given force field to get new solutions in the same force field. I mean, that is because of this nonlinearity. Uh, that's what I just said. Yeah. Uh, so if R1 and R2 are two solutions of Newton's equation for the same force, then in general, the sum of the two is not a solution of the equation for that force. Okay. Um, and that is because the force could depend nonlinearly on the location. Yeah, so I've, I've emphasized what superposition is. Superposition is that forces of different uh, character, different physical origins can be combined to get a total force acting on a particle and you need to do this. However, you cannot add the solutions in the presence of different forces to get the total solution. That does not make sense. And you cannot add two solutions in the presence of the same force to get a third solution. That also doesn't make sense. Yeah. So of course, you are familiar with the examples of this. You may have a, a pendulum bob, which is subject both to tensional force and uh, uh, gravitational force, uh, mass times acceleration due to gravity. And the, uh, the combined force that the bob feels is the vector sum of these two, which should, of course, point um, along the diagonal of that parallelogram. Uh, there is another aspect of this superposition story. Suppose we have a composite body, okay, not a point particle, but a composite body made up, say, of two particles, like in this example. Um, or suppose there is a particle body made up of several constituent parts, um, for example, a rigid body made of several point masses then the total force on the composite body, so we have a concept of total force on the composite body, it is defined as the vector sum of the forces on its constituents. Okay, this is a useful concept. Uh, I mean, it comes into its own when we discuss bodies made up of several parts, which we'll talk about later, hopefully. Um, but this is a very elementary example. If you have a system made of two, two masses, uh, which are connected by a slender rod, maybe even a very uh, light rod, then uh, the, the, the masses on, sorry, the, the forces due to gravity on the two um, point masses can be combined uh, to get a 2 mg magnitude force on the total system. <clears throat> okay, and then it may be possible to treat the total system as one composite object, yeah, uh, perhaps located at the center of mass and so on. Okay, so there are ways to do this kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, okay, so I've uh, tried to uh, tell you some of the um, ideas surrounding Galileo's relativity principle and Newton's second law, as well as superposition. <clears throat> um, okay, any um, questions you have? <clears throat> Okay, if not, let me uh, uh, state uh, Newton's third law. Mm. <clears throat> let us see. Uh, so Newton's third law, uh, uh, Newton's third law says that to every action, there is always opposed an equal reaction. Okay, so that is said in some fancy English. Yeah, let's see what it means. <clears throat> in other words, if body A exerts so this is body A, and then there's a body B. If body A exerts a force on body B, so this would be force of A on B. Then B exerts a force minus F on A. Okay, so the claim is B would then exert a force yeah, minus F. So this is F B on A is the negative of F A on B. <clears throat> Okay, so that is what Newton's second law is saying, sorry, third law is saying. These two forces are called the impressed and expressed forces. So that again is somewhat old fashioned language. Um, we're not obliged to use it. <clears throat> However, there's a very important aspect of the third law. The third law is not needed to understand the motion of a particle subject to given external forces. Okay, so if you are only interested in the motion of a particle subject to gravity here, and gravity is regarded as an external force that is given to you, then there is no need for this third law. <clears throat> um, yeah, 
uh, on the other hand, it is needed to understand the motion of body subject to interparticle forces. Okay, so if you have two bodies subject to interparticle forces, then Newton's third law is important. It, it has non-trivial consequences. Okay, um, let me mention, um, so if your job is in, entirely to study the trajectory of a particle due to given external forces, you can forget about Newton's third law. It plays no role. <clears throat> and we are often dealing with such situations. Mm. Okay, now let me give a couple of examples of Newton's third law, uh, which I'm sure you have heard about before, hopefully. So the sun attracts the earth with a force equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force exerted by the earth on the sun. So that is very much like a picture A and B uh, with these two um, objects. So that could be the sun and the earth. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, another example, a slightly different sort is suppose you have a cubical block of concrete of mass M that lies on the floor. Okay, so you, your system is your concrete and the floor. Um, now, uh, if you were to keep your hand underneath the uh, concrete, you would feel a force that the concrete block exerts on your hand. Okay, so the concrete block exerts a downward force on the floor. Okay. And it has some magnitude. It has a magnitude mass times acceleration due to gravity. So that doesn't matter too much. The value doesn't matter too much here. Okay. But the point is that it does exert a force. Um, now, uh, just as a warning, now this force I'm talking about, the force that the concrete block exerts on my hand, if I'm trying to hold it, it's not the force of the earth on the block. Okay. It may have some deeper origins due to the earth's force and so on, but at this stage, it is simply the force exerted by the cubicle block on my hand or on the ground. Now, on the other hand, the floor by Newton's third law, the floor must exert an equal and opposite reaction force called a normal reaction N of the same magnitude Mg on the block. Okay, so this is what Newton's third law is saying. Um, yeah, so see here, we have two objects. I mean, we have the block and we have the ground or we have the block and we have my palm. So in that situation, Newton's third law does play a role. Um, so in this case, the impressed and expressed forces act on different bodies. So that is another feature that is worth bearing in mind. Um, the force on the ground and then you had the reaction force of the ground on the concrete block. So the impressed and expressed forces act on different bodies. Uh, in this example, both forces can be called normal surface forces. Okay? Um, there is no reason to call only <laughs> the force of the block on my hand as uh, the impressed force and the other one as the expressed force. You can reverse the roles. There is no fundamental uh, sense in which one comes before the other. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and it is just conventional to call the force of the floor on the block by the name normal reaction force. Yeah, uh, it is just our convention. You could equally well call the force of the concrete block on the floor as the reaction force. Uh, yeah, so there is nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> um, so the force of the block on the floor is equally well a normal reaction force. There are other places also where Newton's third law and such um, pairwise opposing forces appear. So for instance, in a fluid, we have such an equal and opposite normal surface force between small neighboring volumes of a fluid. Okay, so you may have a big container and you have, you have a small volume of fluid here and the neighboring volume of fluid there. Yeah, so if I enlarge this a little bit, uh, yeah, the left uh, fluid, exerts a force on the right fluid or right uh, parcel of fluid. And there is a reaction force also towards the left due to the right element of fluid. Okay. So these forces go by a name, they are called pressure. <clears throat> so pressure is a normal force, normal by mean uh, perpendicular to the interface. <clears throat> and uh, we just say the pressure is 
uh, some number, what we mean is that the force exerted per unit area by L on R is that number. And similarly, R on L is that same number. So we just talk about one pressure. <clears throat> um, okay. A any uh, question about these examples? <clears throat> Okay, now I want to make one small comment, which is really with the things from the uh, later stage of the course in mind uh, for future reference. So don't worry if you don't follow this here. Newton's third law also helps us distinguish between a real force. I mean, all forces I have talked to now, talked about now are, are what we would call real forces and a fictitious force in an accelerated or non-inertial frame. Hmm? So it turns out um, uh, that, uh, in an accelerated or non-inertial frame, there are some apparent forces that are present. Yeah, purely because the frame is not inertial. Now, those forces are not associated with equal and opposite reaction forces. Okay, so according to Newton's third law, an acceleration due to a real force felt by a body is distinguished by the presence of an equal and opposite reaction force on some other body. Okay, so Newton's third law says that acceleration to, due to real forces and not fictitious forces are always distinguished by the presence of an equal and opposite reaction force on some other body. Okay, so we can use this idea to check whether a force is real or fictitious. But that is for uh, later reference. Yes. I can, I can explain how Newton's third law is helping us in detecting real and fictitious forces. What yeah. about gravity? Yeah. No, see, gravity is a, a real force. Um, so, gravitational force uh, due to the sun on the earth has a reaction force of the earth on the sun. So, the earth attracts the sun towards itself. Um, yeah, so gravity is a very much a real force <clears throat> so in this, go, in this go framework. Go upwards, go upwards a little bit. Yeah. So you're yeah. saying, uh, uh, can you please explain how, I mean, how Newton's third law is helping us to distinguish between a real force and fictitious force? Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, 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 yeah, see, this deserves some mention at a later stage when we talk about non inertial frames. But the idea is very simple. Um, if you're in an inertial frame, then all forces are real forces. There are no fictitious yeah, forces. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, and yeah. every such force between two bodies must be associated with a reaction force. That is all it is saying. Okay. Yes. Now, now suppose you are in a non-inertial frame and you have some fictitious force present that a particle feels. I claim that there is not any other force that is a reaction to this fictitious force okay so once uh, you cannot go if you go searching for such a reaction force and don't find it then it will suggest that the original force you are talking about was actually a fictitious force okay so that's the idea if you have a force that is not associated with the reaction force then yeah you mean fictitious forces can't have uh, reaction forces correct yeah they do not arise uh, in, in through gravity or through these kind of interfacial things. Yeah, they are not associated with any reaction force. So they can help us, uh, if you want to do it, help us distinguish between real forces and fictitious forces. Because in a non-inertial frame, both are present. You will have some real forces present. You will have some fictitious forces present. The real forces will have reactions. The fictitious forces will not. Okay? So that is the distinction. Um, okay, so that is so far could as you elaborate this with an example. Could you elaborate this? Okay, I will try to do that, but we will first need to have an example of a fictitious force. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so we will have to go to an accelerating car and uh, look at that fictitious force. Um, yeah, um, I will try to do it when I discuss a non inertial frame. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but you can also try it out. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you you try to analyze the forces present uh, on a um, uh, yeah uh, <clears throat> on a body in a car that is uh, accelerating or something like that. 
and uh, try to analyze whether you can uh, pair up all the forces in equal opposite pairs. Um, yeah, and whether this is uh, truly possible when you include even the fictitious force. One has to think about that a little bit carefully. <clears throat> is, the is the centrifugal force here? Uh, no, a centrifugal force is also a fictitious force. That too. Uh, uh, what's yeah. a, the centrifugal force is the fo force of rotating object heats towards the center, right? No, 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 no. Um, centrifugal force is a force as observed in a rotating frame. Okay. I can see in the, this frame, this is the inertial frame in my house, in my lab, in my office. Yeah. <clears throat> you may have a body going round and round. When I observe it, I do not ascribe any centrifugal force to it. There is a different thing called centripetal acceleration. Oh. A body going around a circle does have an acceleration called centripetal acceleration towards the center. That is an acceleration. This, this centrifugal force is directed like away from the center, right? Uh, from the perspective yeah. of the person. Yes, yes. So with respect to the frame of that moving body, that is that the person on a merry-go-round, with respect to their frame, their frame is not inertial because it's accelerating, it's going round, round, round in a circle. Not with respect to the inertial frame, not the person who is standing in the ground watching the person going round and round, but with respect to the person in the merry-go-round, in their frame, one does have an extra force, which is called an fictitious force. That is a centrifugal force, which points outwards. <clears throat> um, okay. Yeah, so I make the big distinction between centrifugal acceleration, which we, sorry, centripetal acceleration, which we have already met. It is simply an artifact of writing things in circular coordinates, for instance, writing the acceleration in um, uh, uh, plane polar coordinates. Yeah, then you come across it. There's a different thing called centrifugal force that has to do with a non inertial frame. <clears throat> okay, any other question? But why is it fictitious? Uh... <laughs> okay. Uh, it is called fictitious <laughs> because it arises. Okay. It is fictitious it is because yeah. it was not present in an inertial frame. So you start in an inertial frame, analyze all the forces present. Hmm? But why can't that be a reaction force? Like to say, force. Uh, like, okay, so you can, even in an inertial frame, you can feel that the string is stretched, right? Which means that the object is pulling. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So that is a centrifugal, uh, centrifugal force. That is not a centrifugal force. It is not. Uh, it is a internally directed force. Yeah. The tension in the string is pulling the ball towards the center. That is a real force. It is a force due to molecules in the string, one against the other, pulling the thing together. That is a real force that is seen in an inertial frame. This centrifugal force is a hocus pocus that you see only when you go to a um, rotating frame. <clears throat> so the tension force is present already in my frame, my fixed frame. It's okay, also present in the- Suppose that the ball was transparent, then any object inside the ball, you would see it getting pushed to the back of the ball, right? Uh, of the, any rotating thing. Um, you know, no. Please say that again. If say there was a box that was rotating and it's transparent and you are in an inertial frame watching it rotate, then everything mm -hmm. inside the box will get pushed to the edge opposite to, from the center, right? Yeah. So you can observe the force in an inertial frame. Wait, wait, wait. We have to be very careful here. I will analyze the situation more carefully. I claim that the motion of objects in that box that is going round and round in a merry-go-round can be described completely without the use of any centrifugal force. It is possible to describe it using forces other than centrifugal. Uh, it is the centrifugal force needs to be invoked only in the frame that is rotating. So, so this distinction we will uh, see fairly soon, I hope. Yeah, like with a car that is more accelerating. So I, I will I will uh, display it for you. Uh, so please hold on. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so yeah, so just please hold on. I, I will uh, show you how it is possible to analyze the motion from an inertial frame, even of an accelerating object. Yeah, I am standing on the side of the road, watching a car that is accelerating, and I'm watching the people inside the car. I am watching a, a pendulum that is hung inside the car. You'll see all these things. It is possible to describe the motion of all those things without invoking any fictitious force. You need the fictitious force only if you are sitting inside the car and want to describe the motion. <clears throat> and this distinction we will make and clarify. So please hold on. Uh, the observed physical effects will be the same no matter which frame you take to describe it. Yeah, the physical effects will be the same. That is, what is the inclination of the pendulum? That kind of thing will be the same. Yeah, or will a person get hurt or doesn't get hurt? Answer to that question again will be the same. But the manner in which we deduce those conclusions will be different. <clears throat> uh, okay, so, but before I get to such matters, I, I still have a few other things to say. Um, but I'm practically out of time now, um, but I can just make one or two statements now. I want to make a distinction between what is called dynamics and kinematics and also statics. So these are words you often hear and uh, they have some meaning. I wanted to say what they mean. Okay, but I noticed that it is 11.45, so perhaps I should do that next time. Mm, any questions you have <clears throat> on what we have discussed? Okay. So Newton's yeah. Newton's third law is not true in non-inertial frames. Can we say this? Um, okay. The way I stated Newton's third law is, uh, yeah, yeah. You you could say that because in Newton's third law, if you use a fictitious force as the force you are discussing, it will not come paired with some reaction force, which is equal and opposite. That's right. So yeah. it doesn't hold in. Yeah. It doesn't hold in non-inertial frames. So all the laws we have described so far are all for inertial frames. If you want to discuss non-inertial frame, you have to transform to that frame and see what you get. That is the strategy. Good question. Yeah. A any other question? <clears throat> Uh, okay, so if not, let us uh, halt here and uh, meet again on uh, Thursday. Mm. Sir, I had a question about the assignment. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, not the assignment specifically, but about the checking. Uh, like, uh, if we make any silly mistakes, huh. uh, what is the policy on that? Oh, if you make a mistake. Uh, you, you will the, the, the grader will uh, check the answer and find uh, assign some mark so i mean if it's uh, the yeah i mean we, we are uh, we understand that uh, we are human we do make some mistake uh, we will deduct some mark as appropriate yeah like missing one dot or missing one uh, comma like that maybe <laughs> okay no yeah. no we are uh, we are reasonable. Okay, uh, this is yeah. not. Uh, we are not uh, checking uh, everything. <laughs> we are checking things, but uh, we are not um, uh, excessively <laughs> uh, picky uh, on, on such yes. things. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, that doesn't give you a license to write whatever you want. I mean, you have to attempt to. Yeah, yes, sir. Obviously, sir. If I write something terribly wrong, obviously I'll get zero. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's so, yeah, yeah. So you you must make an attempt to present your work in a legible and understandable way, conveying the key concepts and explanations. Yeah. <clears throat> and if it is not understandable yes. to me or to <laughs> to us, then it is uh, deficiency is yours. It is your job to explain yes. to us what you have in mind. <clears throat> yes, sir, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Any other question? All right, so thank you very much and have a good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, one, yeah. one uh, sir, are you planning to uh, do exponential matrices, solving differential equations with exponential matrices? It may come up. Yeah, it is a very possible thing. Yeah, let us. Uh, yeah, because the assignment was given come. in very particular to that, the last question. 
Yeah, you have noticed some interesting uh, uh, features of the last question, and uh, that's right. So we will continue the discussion of the last question. Uh, we will continue it further, and uh, definitely uh, such ideas will come up. Definitely, yes. Thank yeah. you, sir. Good point. Yes. Okay. Anything else? <clears throat> okay. 